Praise the Lord. Happy Sabbath, Saints. Happy Sabbath. I want to thank um, my good friend and your, your pastor, Pastor Philip, for the privilege of being with you here today. Um, like the Ella pointed out, and Ella, don't worry, you're not the first person to butcher my sinning. <laughs> for some interesting reason, uh, folks tend to have a hard time pronouncing it. Um, I'm, I'm still to find out why. I'm still to find out why. Um, yeah, but I want to thank Pastor Philip for the privilege of being with you here today. Uh, like the elder pointed out, it's not my first time with you, but my first time here in person. And um, it is an absolute joy. I'm sure since you've reopened your doors, you've been in a place where you're just elated at the fact that you no longer have to sit behind your computer screen, right? Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. So we are grateful to God for it. So anytime I get the opportunity to be um, in a church in person, oh Lord, I'm so grateful for it. <laughs> really happy for it. Um, this morning, well, even before I jump there, I just want to um, give a big shout out to, to my wife. Now, you might think, hmm, this pastor is gloating. Not, not really. My, my wife is my best friend and my partner in ministry. And um, anything I do ministry-wise, she's with me. Normally, when I get um, um, invitations like these, she's with me. But because she's not well, she's not with me today. But I know, I just got a message from her a while ago. I know that she's praying that, that God's will will be done here. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. For the next few minutes, since I want to engage you a little bit in God's word. And I hope and pray that as... Um, I allow God to speak, um, especially in the sentiments of the pastoral prayer offered, that I don't find myself in trouble, that I don't get an invite back here again. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 17, 26 to 29 is our scripture reading, and young Jamai did an excellent job. Let's give him an amen. amen. Praise God. Praise God. But I want to read it again uh, before we go into the message this morning. First Samuel chapter 17, which is 26 to 29. And I will read in your hearing. The Bible says from, well, before we read rather, let's just bow our heads to pray. Father and God in heaven, Lord, again we come before you. Lord, we are aware that what we are about to engage in is something that is beyond man. And so we ask in a very special way that your presence will continue to just envelop this place. Lord, we pray that you will reach and speak to every heart. And as we, your people, come, O oh God, this isn't my doing, O oh Father, but yours. And so I ask on behalf of us, your people, that you will now stand at my side, O oh Lord, for I cannot do this alone. And I pray on our behalf collectively that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Let's agree by saying, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In verse 26, the Bible says, Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride. And the insolence of your heart. For you have come down to see the battle. 
Verse 29 ends by saying, and David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Let me invite you to read that with me. And David said, what have I done now? What's the question? Is there not a cause? Hallelujah. For the next few minutes, I want to speak to you on the troublesome caption, the ultimate cause. Don't tame it. Unleash it. The ultimate cause. Don't tame it. Unleash it. As I spend some time considering um, the way in which this word cause is used here in the Bible, it's evident here that the noun form of the word is meant. So I took some time and I dug a little bit into the Oxford Dictionary to understand the, the noun component, the noun meaning of the word. And the Oxford Dictionary states that it is a principal aim, a movement to which one is committed and is prepared to defend or advocate. So a cause is something that you are fighting for and you are prepared to defend it at all costs. One of the examples that stands out to me is that of Nelson Mandela. Uh, in 1962, of course, he was imprisoned. As a matter of fact, he was on death row. The only reason why he was not put to death is uh, because of the political pressure that the, the then government was getting. But 23 years after being in prison, Mandela got an amazing opportunity. He was told uh, by President Botha, listen, I am willing to give you your freedom today. That's 23 years later. And Botha said, here is what you need to do. In order for me to give you your freedom, you, you must be willing to say to those South Africans who are causing trouble to stop. He says, you, you must uh, uh, go ahead and tell them, uh, stop fighting, stop fussing, stop pushing back, and, and I will give you your freedom. Now, mind you, Mandela is being offered this opportunity, and, and for 23 years, he's been wifeless. Throughout those 23 years, he's not had the privilege of seeing his children grow up. He has missed out on his, his grandchildren being born. He has missed out on so much. What an opportunity. But Mandela sent word back to President Botha, and he told him, if... It is that my people will continue to not be free. My answer is no. He understood this cause. Of course, history uh, tells us that Mandela went on to spend four more years in prison. Mandela didn't tame his cause. Even though freedom was glaring him in the face, he understood that there was something bigger than himself. And so he didn't tame it. He continued to push back. He continued to fight. I want to say to you here this morning, says there are many causes. There are many causes. But there is only one ultimate cause. And that one ultimate cause, I like the way the Apostle Paul puts it for us in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2 and verse 2. There, he simply says to the saints, I want to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'm going in a very troublesome place there. Uh, you see, sometimes some of us, our, us brethren, tend to begin to think that, our, that the ultimate cause for us is to find out everything the Pope is doing. There are other folks who tend to think that it is to, 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 to scratch on every door and to begin to accuse folks. No, Paul says, listen, that which is most vital, that which is most crucial, that which is most important to God is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But as we look at this topic today, the ultimate cause, let me point out here, saints, that unfortunately, not every professed Christian have at the, the, the tip of or, or have it embedded in their, in their hearts what that ultimate cause is. Today we're going to look at the story of a young man at only 17 years old who embodied that ultimate cause and displayed it. Of course, 
We're talking about David. David was driven by this cause. When you think of it well, why, why would, what would inspire him to face a giant like Goliath? He was driven by this cause. Not just a cause that was a, a surface, but that ultimate cause, God's cause. And I want to share with you three, three points here about David's experience that can help you and me get to the place where we also embrace this ultimate cause and to not be in a place where we are going to, 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 to allow it to die off, but to unleash it. The first point here that I find in David's experience is that he embraced the cause passionately. He embraced the cause passionately. We know the story very well, so no need for me to rehash all of it. But just a little background here. So the setup here is that David's father says to him, Hey, uh, I want you to take some food to your brothers. And find out how they are doing. Find out what's happening with the war. So David is being this very obedient young man. He joyfully leaves the sheep jumps on the wagon, takes the provision that his dad gives, and he's, he's, he's making his way towards where the army is. And as David gets closer, David hears a rumbling. David gets there just in time to hear uh, the enemy coming out and, and, and giving what is a, what is. An, an absolute atrocious challenge to the army of God. And what happens here is interesting because what David hears coming from Goliath's mouth uh, begins to stir in him some holy anger. If you come with me to verses 22 and 23, just again to, to give us a bit of perspective. In verse 22, the, the Bible says that he left the supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, the giant Goliath came out. Coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same word, and David heard him. And what happens next with David, for me, Continue to stand out as something that I'm jealous of. Let me tell you what it is. If you come with me here to verse 26 here, I want you to see his passion. Now, we are not able to see David's face. We're not able to hear the tone of his voice. But I want you to see the passion in his words. In verse 26, the Bible says, Then, then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done? For the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel. And, and, and here comes for me the bombshell. He turns to them and he asks, For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That he should defy the armies of the living God. Now let, let, me, let me just pull back here and get excited about this here. When, when, when David asked this question, you need to understand the context. He didn't just ask, Who is this Philistine? He asks, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? There's a reason. There is a reason. You see, you see when you do a little bit of history with, with Israel, you discover here that God said to the Israelites, listen, every male child born mm, on the eighth day must be circumcised, and, and that circumcision means that child belongs to me. That child is holy to me. Mm. So David comes on, and he hears. Lord have mercy. He has this Philistine giving a challenge to Israel and he is basically saying to the army of God, you are nobody. So David hearing this begins to experience this holy anguish within him. Am I speaking to somebody else? And David turns to them and he asks that question. And I can imagine with vehemence within him. And he asks, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this unholy person? Who does he think he is? Doesn't he know who our God is? Doesn't he know how big our God is? He is not even one who is sanctified to God. And yet still, he is dirty mouth.
His dirty mouth is coming up against God. David became angry. David became passionate. And what I love about his hair is he embraced that passion. He embraced it since. Can I, can I say something to you here, brothers and sisters? Every now and then, you and I will see things that are unholy, things that, that stand against God. You need to get to the place where deep down within you, where the cause of God begins to boil you up. Don't tame it, unleash it. I can imagine. Here comes David, amongst grown men who are experienced fighters. And as far as they are concerned, they have a better idea of what's going on than he does. But David does not allow that to stop him. He, only, he makes very clear where he stands. The cause was moving him. If you come with me a bit closer here, I want you to see and to appreciate with me the reason for David's passion. You see, the issue here was not just one army coming up against another. The issue here, saints, was that the, the def, was the defying of the army of God. Now, why is that important? You see, it's important because the defying of the army of God is the same as the defying of God. Can I say that again? Can I say that again? Do you remember when Saul was going up against the children of God, killing them? He never met Jesus before. But Jesus met, he, he, uh, Saul w- was persecuting the saints. But Jesus met him and Jesus asked him, Saul, why are you persecuting? You see, friends of mine, when you persecute the saints, you're persecuting God. Somebody did, did, didn't get that. When you defy the people of God, you defy God. So David understood this. And realizing that God is the one being defied here, David becomes passionate. Now, 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 now here's what I'm suspecting got him even more animated. You see, friends of mine, the, if, 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 if you come with me to verse 10, verse 10 is troublesome. Verse 10 is troublesome. If you come with me to verse 10, verse 10 says, And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Now there's something here that you need to understand. The Philistines were actually on Israelite land. Yeah. So I'm coming into your home. And I will disrespect you in your house. The Philistines were on Israelite land. And here is what's troublesome in verse 11. Verse 11 says, When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So not only, not only is the army of God and God being defied. Saints, forgive me for where I'm going there, but I have to. It's not my fault. It's the word of God. But now the people of God are failing God where that where, 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 where this situation is concerned as opposed to standing for God and trusting the word of God they are afraid they are afraid so here you have a situation where unfortunately the church is sitting and seeing the enemy come in and mess up the work of God. The enemy is coming in and, and lives are being destroyed. And the church sits by and the church is afraid. The church is doing nothing. So David finds himself as a result in that place since where, where he is passionate. And even though, even though everyone is marching to a particular drum beat, David is going in the opposite direction because he embraced the cause passionately. Not, not too long ago, while I was pastoring back home in St. Lucia, I, 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 
we, 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 had, um, we were preparing for our regular week of prayer. At the beginning of every year, we, we have it. And the norm that you would know is for us to have either one preacher or several preachers stand in the front and preach. And um, that's what was established. That's what we were going to do. But a few of my elders came and they said, Pastor, we, 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 we want to change it this year. And I said, Elder, why? And he said, Pastor, because um, there are people out there who are not coming in here. Can I be honest with you? You see, it's good to admit when you're wrong. I, as pastor, fought against them. I said, Brethren, no, 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 no. Uh, this is the direction that we are, we are going, and that's where we must keep it. And listen, the, the weeks went on, and the elders were adamant. They said, Pastor, we need to go out with this. Eventually, I gave in. Let me admit, reluctantly. But the results was phenomenal. Here's what we did. We, 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 we split the church up in groups. And each group was responsible to, to, to go to a particular area. There were folks in the community that we, we knew. So, so the, we were able to enter the homes of some of those people that were the hub. So every night, the, the, the groups in question would meet at this particular home. And word began to spread. And as word began to, to spread, other folks began to come in. And here's what amazed me when the reports came. You know, there is something called, that I call a God slap. I'll explain to you what a God slap is. It's when God is trying to tell you something and you're not hearing it, and he has to slap it into you. When the reports came, God slapped into me the relevance of what the elders were saying. Because here is the thing. We took the the leaflets or the, the booklet with the sermons in them. And every night, as opposed to one person coming up here to preach, the members, together with the, the folks in the community, would sit and read through the sermons. They would discuss the sermon. And then there were individuals who would tell them, hey, I don't know how to pray. Tell me how. I love to hear the way you do it. I want to speak to God that way. Listen to me. says, two years later, the results of this was phenomenal. Let me say something to you here. When God has placed his cause in your heart, embrace that cause with passion. Uh, don't get to the place where you are going to allow people to get in the way of what God has given you to do. Embrace it, saints. With passion. But I have a challenge here for us, the church. Can you see, because we live in a world that is sick, in a world that is constantly being challenged with, with situations, and we are used to it, we tend not to see the cause of God because it's normal for us. But let me just remind you here, friends of mine, that because of who God is and what he has come to do, when people feel hopeless, helpless, and worthless, there is a cause. When communities seem clueless, cares less, and in distress, there is a cause. When the nation as we know it is depressed, distressed, and dispossessed, there is a cause, saints. When churches pray less, prays less, and becomes powerless. I say there is a cause. And when young people seek God, but remain churchless, there is a cause, saints. And here's what I want you and me to appreciate here. I know that because of who God is and how he functions, he places his cause in every single one of us. The thing is, some of us decide to let it stay buried and die. Others of us decide to nurture it and to grow it. But here's what I want you to know. If God has placed his cause within you, embrace that cause passionately. I like the way the Apostle Paul puts it in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. It's a very well-known passage, uh, but it just punches that point 
uh, to a great extent here in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. I want to share with you here how the Apostle Paul characterizes uh, that cause in light of his own ministry. And this is how he puts it. I love it. He says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, he says, forgetting those things which are behind me. He says, I'm not even focused about my past, whatever it is. I'm reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And here is his passion. He says, I press, hallelujah, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Says, God's ultimate goal is for people to be saved. His ultimate goal is for folks to get to know him as their personal Lord and Savior. And that must move us as God's people. It has to move us as God's people. But there's something else here about David's experience that I want to bring out. He didn't just embrace the cause passionately. But David also had to fight through cause barriers zealously. You might be wondering where I'm going with this. Let me, let me make a statement here. There will always be challenges when it comes to pursuing God and God's will. There will always be. If you examine David's story uh, uh, very well as we go back to 1 Samuel chapter 17, you will notice with me here that David's fiercest battle was not against Goliath. Can I say that again? David's fiercest battle was not against Goliath. David's fiercest battle on that, that day was against his own people. Now you might ask me, what am I talking about? Yes, Goliath was a giant. But when you read the story, and we'll come to it in a while, as far as David was concerned, Goliath entered the battle at a disadvantage. As far as David was concerned, Goliath was already defeated. So his biggest battle was not Goliath, but against his own people. Let me share the two that are recorded here with you. The first one comes from his eldest brother, Eliab. In verse 28, the Bible says, Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? He says, I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Let's understand it says, Eliab looks at David and he says to David, hey, you are here because of your pride. Now, watch you here. David is genuinely, genuinely experiencing the cause of God burning within him, but he is accused of speaking because of his pride. Eliab tells him, uh, 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 your, your, your motive for coming here is wrong. And David came because his dad told him to come. And Eliab does something else that folks tend to do when they, when, when they try, or rather when they don't understand what God has placed inside of you. Eliab began to demean him. Eliab told him, who have you left those few sheep with? He says, you don't belong here, boy. Who do you think you are? Go back to the sheep. Go back to your low place. Go back to that substandard thing that you are used to. So David finds himself challenged here. Now, according to uh, uh, the practice back then, because Eliab is his oldest brother, he was supposed to obey him. Oh, somebody needs to help me here. But David fought through that barrier with zealousness, with zeal. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you come with me to verses 29 and 30. In verse 29, the Bible tells us here, 
David, this is David's response to his brother. And David said, what have I done now? He says, is there not a cause? He says, you are accusing me of being prideful. You are accusing me of having a wrong motive. And you are demeaning me. But he says, that for which I'm speaking about, isn't there a reason? Isn't there a cause? Isn't God's name being defied? Isn't God being challenged here? So David does that, and what David does next is amazing. You see, if your oldest brother is speaking to you, you are to obey him, not so? But let's examine what happens in verse 30. The Bible tells us here, then he turned from him. Lord have mercy. Back in the day, friends of mine, if I would do something like that, my mother's hand would be across my face so fast. But David realized that, that, that what he was fighting for here was something that was bigger than the custom of the day. So it appeared as if he disrespected his brother, but he wasn't disrespecting him. God was pushing him. The cause of God so arrested him that the Bible says he turned from his brother and he asked the men the same question again for which his brother was chastising him. Here is barrier number two. Some folks heard, so they sent to Saul and he says, Hey, King Saul, there's someone here who's willing to fight Goliath. And of course, Saul is happy because he doesn't want to do it. And when Saul uh, sends to call him and Saul sees David, there's a problem. If you come with me down to verse 33. In verse 33, the Bible says to us here, and, and Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine. To fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Saul tells him, listen David, uh, 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 there, there are two challenges that you have. Two problems. Number one, you are too young. And he says, number two, you are inexperienced. And what Saul does here, if you notice with me well, is amazing. Saul takes the time, and he pulls out Goliath's resume for David. He tells David, you are only a youth, but this man has been a warrior from his youth. When you examine the story, the Bible calls him a champion. Do you know why? Well, I'm happy you asked. I will tell you. Uh, the Bible calls him a champion because those individuals would fight on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And they fight to the death. So it meant that every single battle Goliath went into with someone else one-on-one, -on -one, he came out as the champion. It wasn't by accident that he's here saying, hey, send me one man. But here's what I love about this passage. As soon as, uh, as soon as Saul finishes bringing out Goliath's resume, David brings out his own resume. Oh, Lord, have mercy. If you come with me to verses 44 to 47. 44 to 47. The Bible says, but, but David said to Saul, he said, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. Hallelujah. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, he says, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. In verse 46, uh, he says, your servant has killed both lion and bear. He says, what comes next gets me excited. He said, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. And David says in verse 47, moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me. 
Hallelujah. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Then he says, hey, yes, you pull out his resume, but here's mine. He says, I've been to places with God. I've seen his hand work with me on a one-on-one. Saints, what I'm trying to bring out to you here is this. Until you've been there yourself. Until you've been there yourself. You are not ready to open your mouth and say, here is my resume. Same church I told you about. We, we, we found ourselves in a place where I did a campaign there now. I love preaching. I love evangelism, as my good Ella pointed out. So, in St. Lucia, two years after I got baptized, I did my first evangelistic campaign. God blessed it. 20 odd persons got baptized. I did one the following year. Some more folks gave their lives to Christ. When I was here about 15 years ago at Ilford SDA Church, got involved again in evangelism. And of course, here it's a bit more difficult than back home, but the Lord still pulled through. I remember one year under the directorship of Pastor Chitura, um, you know, Ilford Church was on the front page of, is it the Gleanings here? The Messenger here. Um, why? Because we had baptized the most across the entire conference. So I love evangelism. Went back home in St. Lucia, and, and every campaign I've had, again, folks saw, saw hundreds of persons have come to Christ through my ministry. So I'm having an evangelistic campaign with that particular church. And Lord have mercy. And I preached for five weeks. And at the end of the fifth week, one person got baptized. Now let me be honest with you. As a person, as someone who told the church, let's go, we'll do it. And mind you, they said, Pastor, no, we won't. We know those people. It was a blow for me. But I was able to sit down, look at this thing, lick my wounds, if you please, and to say, Lord, something is wrong here. Because you said your words will not return unto you void. So he went back to the drawing board. You see, the barrier here for me was not other people but me. It was from within me. My insecurities began to kick in. My, my doubts began to kick in. Where, where do I go next? Do I just leave this alone and press on and say, well, those people are irredeemable? I went back on my knees and the Lord directed and he said, listen, you need to move the church in prayer. So we went in that direction since. And what happened next to me was phenomenal. When we went in that direction, God began to uncover stuff. That was messing up the church. One by one, a stuff that, that folks had no clue about for years. God began to uncover it. And there are some individuals whom we had to remove from office. What happened next was phenomenal. A few months down the line, the, peop the same people in the community who would not attend the campaign began to walk to church. A year later, I had another campaign in the church, a smaller campaign, with a young man who had never preached a campaign before in his life, his first time. And instead of five weeks that I preached for, he preached for two weeks. At the end of the second week, 16 souls gave their lives to Christ. We went for a third week, and 24 souls gave their lives to Christ. So here's what I'm trying to say to you here. When you come across barriers to God's cause, you must fight through it with zeal. Huh? Don't allow the disappointments to keep you behind. Go back on your knees. Call on God if you must. 
Yes, those challenges are there. But you must not get to a place where you will give in because of fear and insecurity. Don't get to a place where you will give in because of what other folks are saying against you or about you. If God placed it in you, he placed it in you, not them. Discouragement is designed to derail us. It has the potential to hurt and to sabotage. But it's worse, friends of mine, when it comes from within. But here's how I'm suspecting David was able to deal with this in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6. The Bible here gives us a little inkling into, into David's life. 1 Samuel 6 and verse 30. In verse 30, the Bible says, the Bible says to us here, in, in, in verse 6, sorry, now David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But the Bible says, but David, hallelujah, strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Can I come close to you here with this sense? Is, is, is that all right? Let me tell you this. You need to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. Uh, uh, there are times when you won't have folks cheering for you. Get to the place, saints, where you can cheer yourself up in the Lord. You see, not everyone will understand the pain that you're going through. But everyone will understand that which God has placed upon you. Not everyone will be able to comprehend or appreciate what God has called you to. But they, but. When those times come, when you find yourself feeling down and discouraged and you want to give up, learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, every, uh, just this week gone, I think it was on Monday, I did my devotion and, and, and Lord have mercy. My wife was at work, my first daughter at work, so only my two last daughters with me in the, in the house. So I'm five o'clock in the morning, I'm doing my devotion and hey, I'm having a praise party. All by myself. You know why? It might sound strange to you. But I was just given by God a renewed understanding of what it meant to be loved by him. Not because there's anything in me that makes me worthy. But because his love is so surpassing even my own mess. Since I began to have a good time in the Lord all by myself with my Bible in my living room. Get to the place where you learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. Because saints, let me tell you this. This battle that we are part of is real. It is real. And if God's cause is in you, understand with me here. That sometimes the very people who stand against it, they stand against it because they've not experienced what you've experienced. You are the one in the wilderness who, who, who experienced the victory against the lion and the bear. They didn't. So if God has said to you, hey, the same way I delivered you from the lion and the bear, I will deliver this Philistine into your hand. Don't be afraid of it. Sometimes you have to walk it alone, but walk it with him. Like I said, I hope I don't find myself in trouble here for some of what I'm saying. But here's the last point here from David's experience. You must nurture the cause devotionally. Nurture the cause devotionally. What am I talking about? Friends, when it comes to being passionate about God's cause, you will agree with me that some people have it more than others. Can I say that again? There are some persons who seem to be more more zealous for the things of God than others. Isn't that true? Yeah. And the question is, why? Why? 
We have a classic example here with David and the Israelite army. David appears to have a certain level of certainty, but the army exhibits fear. And you will observe with me here, that's because David sees the battle from a spiritual perspective. Whereas the others see it as something purely physical and natural. You might wonder where I got that from. Well, it's in the narrative. Let me share with you here. The men of Israel referred to Goliath as this man. David referred to him as this uncircumcised Philistine. He saw it spiritually. The men of Israel said about Goliath's challenge, surely he has come up to defy Israel. David, on the, on the other hand, says he, that he should defy the armies of the living God. The men of Israel referred to uh, 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 what would happen to him being dead as the man who kills him. David sees it as the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel. What I'm trying to say to you here, saints, is simply this. It makes a difference which glasses you have on. You see, if you have on your own glasses, you will only see things from your perspective. But hey, when you see things with God's glasses on, you begin to see differently. Am I speaking to somebody here? You know, I, 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 there's this, this uh, analogy I love. If, if, if you have learned to walk with giants, certain challenges that come your way, they don't seem that big anymore. Because if you're standing on the shoulder of the giant, you will look down and that which would be a challenge for you in your own strength begins to look small and insignificant. It is no wonder, brothers and sisters, that David saw Goliath as one who was already defeated. Let me share with you David's secret. If you come back to me, with me to uh, 1 Samuel 17 and verse 45, I want to share with you here that which I believe to be David's ultimate weapon against Goliath. In verse 45, the Bible says, Then David said to the Philistine, He says, You come to me with a sword, with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Let me, let me, let me show, share this with you here. Many times when we think of the story of David versus Goliath, we think of it as David the midget versus Goliath the giant. But when you examine it from David's perspective, David actually saw it as Goliath the midget versus God the giant. That's why he told him, you're not fighting me. You're fighting God. And bro, nobody fights God and win. If you are coming up against God, you've already lost. It is no wonder David was so certain that this battle was already in the bag. Oh, Lord have mercy. I just wish sometimes that God's people can understand and see what God is doing and saying. But here's what you need to get. You go back to the book of Deuteronomy. And a long time ago, God told the Israelites, anytime your enemies come up against you, I will fight for you. Sometimes we tend to forget that sense. And don't get me wrong. I understand it. I've been there. There have been times when the fear of failure has so gripped me that where God wants me to go, I don't go. And the Lord sometimes has to remind me with a God slap. But it is absolutely critical for you and me to understand our hate. If we are going to do this thing called church, this is not just about you being able to come here, sitting down, and going back home and doing nothing. No, no, no. God has called you to something that is alive. He has called the saints to something that breathes. 
not oxygen, but the Holy Spirit. God has called us to something that is able to be so impactful that the lives of people can be transformed through it. And that's the reason why, saints, this ultimate cause must not be tamed. It must be unleashed. It must be unleashed. Let's, let's, let's go this a bit further here. Now, remember I told you that David brought out his resume? If you can mark with me to verse 47. Remember David said to him, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. David says, was absolutely certain beyond doubt that God was going to give the victory. No doubt in his mind that this was already in the bag. Let me, let me share with you my own personal experience here. I remember when I was here the first time. It was a challenging time. Financially. My wife was the only one working. I was at Newbold College, living in East London. So, you know, I would travel three hours each day to get to class, three hours to come back. It was tough. And because my wife was the only one working, getting the funds to pay my school fees was just an absolute headache. I did six semesters there. Of the six semesters, I was able to pay my school fees on time only once. And there's this girlfriend of mine. Every, every, every time the semester was coming to an end, we, 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 we would be on the phone and she would call and she'd say, hey, Nick, what's, what's up? How are things going? And I would tell her, yeah, not too bad, you know. And then she'd ask, you know, wow, things are so hard, things are so tough. I'm not sure how I'll get the rest of the money to pay for the rest of semester. And she would say, you know, I already have X amount of thousands of pounds. I'm missing so much more and so on. And she just goes on and on and on. And then, and then, she would, she, she would ask me, and I, then I, I would rather encourage and tell her, you know what, let's just trust God, he's going to do it. He'll do it. And then she would ask me, but how much do you have? And I'll tell her nothing. <laughs> and it was one day, when we were having that conversation at the beginning of, uh, as we were getting ready for an other semester, she said, you know what, I realize that every single time when we are having this conversation, you encourage me, and I always have more money than you. And when I ask you how much you have, your answer is always nothing. And she said, how come you are so calm? And I'm fretting so much. Truth is, I never gave much thought to it before. But thinking about it, I realized since that when you are beginning to take a new journey with God. And you have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's a troublesome place to walk. But he says, I'll be with you. So you're afraid to go. But you take one foot and you step in the darkness anyway. You're a little bit afraid. But you realize that, hey, I'm still here. And you continue to trust God. And you go in a bit deeper. There will be stuff that will cause you to get afraid. But because the only way to move is forward, you keep going with God. Am I speaking to somebody else here? Over time, says, what begins to happen to you is you get so used to winning with God that when other challenges come, you see it as an other opportunity for God to show off. David looks at his situation and he says, hey, if God gave me victory over the lion and the bear, this uncircumcised Philistine is dead. Can I trouble you here with this some more? All you have to do, saints, is remember how the Lord blessed you in the past. Go back to what he's done for you before. Don't forget it. 
Take the time, deliberately trouble your mind and, re and re recollect the difficult times that you had and how it seemed like there was no way out and how God pulled you through. Every single time the devil tells you no, point him back to what God did and keep moving forward. But I need to say something here to you, Sid. And please don't get vexed with me for this. But I have to say it. You see, sometimes some people want to get to the place where they will stand up in front of the entire army to face their Goliath. But let me give you a warning here. You are not ready to face your Goliath in public until you've defeated your lions and your bears in private. Can I say that in a different way? Is that all right? You see, when David fought against the lions and the bears, there was no church to say amen. It was just him and God alone. Are you with me here, somebody? There was no church to say amen. There was no one to shake his hand at the end of the day and to say, well done, that was a good sermon. It was just him and God alone said and like I said to you a little while ago, until you get to the place where you learn, where you learn, hallelujah, to put on your worship for your audience of one, you're in trouble. Because if you're going to do it so that the church can be the ones to say to you, well done, brother so-and-so, well done, sister so-and-so, you will be disappointed. Get to the place where you learn first to defeat your lions and your bears in private. I know sometimes it's difficult when persons have hurt you for you to forgive them. But you must defeat those lions and bears in your closet. On your own. When folks don't know what's going on in your mind and they don't understand the pain in your heart, Deal with it with you, between you and God alone. And I can guarantee you, when, you, when God has given you that victory, you are able to stand with him and face the Goliaths that will come your way. And there are a few things here that I need to, to, to tell you before we bring this to a close. I want you to appreciate with me here. Now, what I'm sharing with you here. It's not so much tied to the message, but it is so sweet that if I leave it out, I feel like I'm doing something wrong. If you come with me to verse 46, I want you to begin to appreciate this with me as we see how this plays out for David. Now, you'll remember with me here that the battle is set. Amen? Battle is set. The Philistine army is on one side of, of the valley, on a mountain. The Israelite army is on the other side. David and Goliath alone are in the valley, getting ready to face each other. Are we clear? David comes with what we weapons? A sling and five stones. Not so? Goliath comes, he has his sword, he has his spear. But observe with me what David does here. Fascinating. Bible says, David says to him, this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know. Hallelujah. God's cause. And there is a God in Israel. He says, listen. I will cut off your head. But David doesn't enter the battle with a sword. Goliath does. Can I make love to this right there? Is that all right? 
You see, when your enemy comes to the battle, and they don't understand that they are fighting God and not you, whatever weapon they bring in the battle to take you out, God will place that weapon in your hand against them. David didn't enter the battle with a sword. Goliath did. But David says to him, Today, not only will you die, but I will use the sword that you have used to defy God. And that sword will be used to take you out. Saints, let me put it to you in a different way. Don't be afraid when you are standing with God. God is all involved in his own business. He wants to see it succeed. So guess what? He will give you everything you need so that success can be realized. Let the cause of God burn within you and move you forward with it. But there's something else that you need to see. Verse 48 now remember with me here that the armies of Israel is on one side. Armies of the Philistines on the other side. And David and Goliath are the ones in the valley. But observe this with me here. The Bible says, so it was. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David. So Goliath stood up and he's coming to David and he begins to mouth off on David. The Bible says that David hurried. I don't know if you got that. David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Now, 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 let's try to picture this here. Philistine army right here. Not so? Israelite army right here. David and Goliath in the middle. Goliath rises from his army and he's walking to meet David. David rises from his and he runs towards Goliath. Can I paint that for you in a different way? Is that alright? Just imagine with me here. The Philistine army jeering, chanting. They are confident that Goliath will win. Why? Because he's a champion. But not only that, they are making fun at the Israelite army. You guys are so coward. Are you sending a boy to do your work? And I can imagine the laughter and the ridicule there. So Goliath has all the support he, he needs behind him. His cheerleaders are there cheering him on. And David is here on the other side. And the army behind him are afraid. They're not cheering him on. Because they're also ashamed. Here is this 17-year-old boy. Who's going to fight a battle that he's certain to lose? But hey, since David was so confident that this battle was already in the bag, the Bible tells me he ran towards the Philistine army to fight Goliath. Brethren, when you understand. That you don't need a whole majority to win. Just God. You are right. Because let me put it to you this way. It is important for you and me to understand, says, that you plus God is always the majority. You might not have cheerleaders behind you. But if the Lord is with you, says, the battle is already won. You see, when the cause of God becomes what drives you and you are passionate about it, God rises with you because God is interested in his own glory. He's interested, says, in his own victory. But there's one more point I want to bring out to you and then I will stop making noise in your ears. If you come with me to verse 52. Verse 52, and this, this is where for me, I appreciate the beauty of who God is, where his cause is concerned. Verse 52 says, now the men of Israel, so imagine with me now, Goliath got struck in the head, his head is cut, everyone is stunned. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines 
as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron, and the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Sharaim, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Here's what I'm trying to bring out to you here. Remember the same folks who's, who were not cheering him? Hello? The same folks who were not cheering him. The same eldest brother who told him, you came here with bad mind. The same king who told him, you are too young, you can't. Saints, sometimes, sometimes God is waiting on you and me to pay attention to the cause that he is growing within us so that others can see and also be blessed. So that the church can see and also follow. There is God's ultimate cause. And my biggest prayer, saints, is that God's people will not just merely play church. Brethren, we can't do that anymore. Take a good look around at what's happening. COVID made us realize that only 40% of our members were really founded on God. COVID did that. We've been hemorrhaging young people for a long time and paying very little attention to it. If God has placed his cause within you, irrespective of what the majority might prefer, let that cause grow within you. Because Christ in him, the hope of glory, is what matters. Paul says, and he put it very nicely. He says, I want to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is what matters. God bless you.